Hello, everybody. I am Dryptosaurus. Uh, I do paleontology, primarily focused on some uh, Cenozoic and late Mesozoic uh, birds. Um, I have been preparing to present uh, a little poster at SVP for the last couple of weeks, so sorry if you are subscribed to me and you have not seen a great amount of content. Um, I will at some point probably make a video covering that research and breaking it down. Uh, it is publicly available on the SVP website if you would like to uh, take a look at it. There's like a little thing. But um, considering that I am someone with a uh, little bit of personal experience with and just generally an interest in Cenozoic animals. Um, I thought it would be cool to watch the Prehistoric Planet Ice Age trailer. I'm not sure if this is covering the broader Ice Age of like the entire Cenozoic. I know there's some stuff that does that like Walking with Beasts or if it's covering a more specific range of time. I've tried to avoid spoilers for it um, just so I enjoy it as much as I can but I'll be blind reacting to the trailer and talking about what I see and what I think as I go. The trailer's only a minute long, but I do like to yap, so this video might end up being a relatively long one. Um, with that, let's uh, let's get into it. So here we have some ground slots. Oh wow! A roll around the snow is the perfect way to give their thick, shaggy coats a clean. That's beautiful. So what you see with these ground slots is they're in a very, very cold environment. Now, that's not typically what we would expect of slots, given that they're uh, confined to more tropical areas in the modern day. But the reality is the two genera of slots, I believe it's genera, or maybe it's just the two species, two-toed and three-toed, are not actually that closely related. The group of sloth is not... Uh, one branch with our modern slots, and then there's this whole lineage of giant ground slots. It's really, there's a bunch of different kinds of ground slots, uh, and the little two groups that survived are the ones that went up to the trees. So ground slots were really not that much like our modern slots in a lot of ways. Um, unlike our modern slots, they probably have relatively high metabolisms, uh, at least uh, the ones that are more medium sized like this. Uh, in general, they were larger animals, obviously. Um, being larger means it takes a lot less effort to maintain a higher body temperature. So these guys would absolutely be loving the snow. Um, they're not, they're absolutely not, you know, adapted to exclusively tropical environments like our modern slots are. There are some ground slots that lived in hotter climates that probably would be um, really upset somewhere like this, like the Shasta ground sloth. Um, but overall, they're doing pretty all right. Another really interesting thing about ground sloths is that just like armadillos, which they're closely related to, they have uh, armor under their skin. Armadillos obviously have that armor on the surface, but ground sloths have these little pebbles of bone underneath their skin um, that uh, basically... Uh, provide protection and they're found in association with ground sloths quite frequently. So if I look up ground sloth osteoderm here, yeah, so you can see there's these little pebbles of, of bone uh, material in there. That's a cool thing by Yoshua Noop. Um, but yeah, so there's these little tiny chunks of bone. And if you've heard the word osteoderm before, it's probably because that's what is on the back of Ankylosaurus. Osteoderm is a pretty generic term. It kind of just means bone in skin, um, but, but skin turning into bone is a pretty common thing throughout nature. So it's a trait that you see evolve and devolve multiple times. For example, the Poposaurids are a group of uh, close relatives to crocodiles. And so they evolved from animals that had very extensive and elaborate osteoderms, but the poposaurs are primarily active predators that want to go fast. They're good runners, they have long legs, um, and some of them are bipedal. So the poposaurs lose their osteoderms. They have very smooth skin, as far as we can tell. Um, so ground, uh, ground sloths are very much not an exception to the rule when it comes to just developing this trait kind of out of nowhere. Uh, and in the case of the modern sloths, losing it for whatever reason.
you see these guys are really bear-like in appearance, which is very interesting to me. Um, at the museum that I used to work at uh, for a short time as an intern, um, there was a big mounted ground sloth skeleton, and the museum was famous for having a short-faced bear, uh, and we talked about it a lot in our exhibits, and there was a short-faced bear display. But when people passed the ground slot, they always, uh, you know, probably five out of ten times, probably assumed that it was uh, a bear and they they talked about it as though it was a short face bear but it's not because under the label it says paramylodon which is a kind of ground sloth um, and that really speaks to the really really bizarre anatomy that these guys have i mean they do look quite similar to bears even though they're not closely related to them at all the closest relatives of giant ground sloths that are not living sloths are things like anteaters armadillos they're they're part of a group called xenarthra uh, which means i think weird uh so weird body or something like that strange joint yeah uh so you can see the ground sloths are in there uh and then the anteaters and their relatives they're just really really crazy and they're unique to the new world so they uh the ground sloths came up from uh, i believe they came up from south america um during what's called the Gabby, the Great American Biotic Interchange. So here's a great image for this. So the, the Great American Biotic Interchange, you see there's all these animals um, that are coming down to South America. That's where South America got uh, its proboscideans, where it got its saber cats, uh, which are now extinct, sadly, the rabbits horses, all that sort of stuff. And then up from South America came things like the terror birds, the ground sloths, the armadillos. Um, many of these guys sadly did not make it to the modern day. There were also a lot of marsupials involved in this. Um, generally, the South American ones tended to fare a little bit worse than the North American ones, unfortunately, because I think the South American ones are cooler, but maybe that's just because they're not around. Okay, so I think that is all of the video that's currently out for Prehistoric Planet, but that doesn't mean I can't still get excited looking at just the episode summaries, um, or at least whatever is here. So these guys, I think, are Homotherium. Uh, this is a European saber-toothed cat. Um, they are really, really incredible, um, and I, I really like what they've done with the skull shape here. Some people have compared the skull shape of Homotherium to a dog. It has almost like a Gorgonopsid type skull construction. It's very different from what you would expect from a cat. But then again, that's how saber cats are. Their anatomy is very different. Their method of eating is very different. And so they're going to have very different um, structured skulls to accommodate those very, very bizarre teeth. So I really like what they've done here. These animals look incredible. Um, then again, we do have a frozen homotherium, and it's not this color. I don't know if these are explicitly homotherium, but if it is, um, then it's a shame that they you know, didn't know about that when they made these. Granted, it's definitely too far to go back now. I wonder if they'll show them molting into different coats, because that's also possible. Um, and then we have this guy. This is a, quote, saber-toothed tiger. That is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, is people calling saber cats tigers. They are cats. They're, they're truly cats. Um, but saber-toothed cats are about as close to a tiger as a house cat is to a tiger. They're in a completely different family called Machairodontinae. Um, they're not at all closely related to lions, tigers, anything like that. Um, they're off to the side in their own thing, which is why it's so remarkable that we have such well-preserved specimens of them, especially that homotherium mummy, because that is a specimen of an animal with such detail from a whole family that is extinct, not just a genus or a species, a whole family. Uh, it's really, really incredible to see. Um, and then we have this uh, rock climbing ground sloth. Um, I do really like how they've done like the Tom and Dua thing of having the baby ride on the mother. There's a group of climbing anteaters that will do something like that. So I think that's very plausible behavior. Then you have this glyptodont uh, called glyptotherium. Uh, these guys are close relatives of armadillos. They came up from South America to North America during the Great Biotic Interchange uh, during the end of the last ice age or around then. Um, I think it was about, 
I don't know exactly how many millions of years ago it was, um, but it is it is later in the in the Cenozoic, so relatively recent in the grand scheme of things. Um, but yeah, so there's your Glyptotherium, very interesting looking animal. It looks like this forbidden cross between a reptile and a mammal, which is why I love Xenarthrins so much. And then, oh, this is Jefferson's giant ground sloth that that is depicting. Um, so Jefferson's giant ground sloth was discovered by Thomas Jefferson, although he called it Megalonyx jeffersoni um, because he thought it was uh, a lion with giant claws. That's what that name means. Megalonyx means giant claw. And its claws do indeed look like a lion. Um, but he was terrified because he didn't believe in extinction. And so he thought there was like a 40 foot tall lion running around in the American West. Um, but yeah. And then here are some woolly rhinos. These guys are rendered beautifully. I love how they have these keratin striations on the horns. Just everything about these designs is so, so real looking. Um, there are some hopes and wishes that I have. Um, I know that there is allegedly a segment set in Australia. Um, I, there was an image of a Thalaka Leo posted somewhere, but I can't find it on here. Um, but that uh, Thalaka Leo is an animal that is exclusive to Australia. And if we're in Australia, I think it would be a massive, massive missed opportunity to not mention or depict the myriad of amazing extinct crocodilians uh, that occupied Australia and Oceania during the end of the Ice Age, because they are some of the most incredible animals ever. Um, things like, you know, the cleaver-headed crocodile, Mechasuchus, the last true terrestrial archosaurs, besides the birds, of course, because um, nowadays all of our living pseudosuchians are semi-aquatic. Uh, even the Cuban crocodile, which is a terrestrial predator, still spends most of its time in the water. But during the end of the Ice Age, you had these very, very resilient, um, just teetering on the edge of extinction uh, at the very end, and then they, they were wiped out by a whole series of climate changes. Um, but they are really, really amazing, really beautiful animals uh, and very well adapted to something that none of us have any context for in the modern day. They're doing things that no living crocodilian can. Um, so that's definitely something I'm excited for. I'm also excited for some of the extinct birds that they'll be showing off. Um, as someone who works with birds, um, I think they're really cool. Um, I don't have any, you know, particular picks besides the obvious being, you know, the moa, the the giant elephant bird, because um, those are so amazing. Um, but I don't know how wide this series is spanning. I would love to see some seriemas or other kyrema forms, um, you know, some smaller terror birds are, I think, always really cool. Um, I, I also really like Ice Age whales. I think they're beautiful. I, I don't know if there's an episode focusing on that. Again, I'm trying to go into this relatively blind, um, but I am very, very excited for this series. Uh, and so I hope everybody enjoyed this little reaction and breakdown. So have a good day.